Hi guys, this is Robin with Weight Loss Apocalypse again. I have a small section of a session that I recorded yesterday. This is um, so good. This client came to me, she's been watching my YouTube videos for a couple of years and um, kind of relapsed into her binge eating when she decided to do a weight loss exercise program. And within a couple of weeks, she was full-fledged binging and decided to contact me. She is now 335 plus pounds, and we are going through a process of recovery, which includes the acceptance of your weight and that it will never get better. And so this is our fourth session, and she, oh, I think in her desperate desire and will for freedom she has opened herself up to fully accepting her weight and her life and that people will reject her and make assumptions about her and and, that, and everything that goes along with accepting her weight so in this session we're talking about how amazing recovery feels and how rapid um, your brain changes and how you feel changing. So in this small clip of this session, um, I'm t work, I, I was trying to describe to her why I believe it is such a huge transformation. There's no physical change that's happened, but because we've changed her beliefs and her perceptions and her willingness and she's facing fear and all of that, how it could be impacting her biology. And so in this short clip, I'm describing Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm also talking about survival mode. And I'm um, applying Dr. David R. Hawkins' map of consciousness to this concept and explaining to her kind of how both of these might be a, a great way to see why all of a sudden she's feeling the way she is, her perceptions are changing, how insignificant her weight is to her. That's fly won't leave me alone. Anyways, how insignificant her her weight is at this point, even though she is considered morbidly obese. Um, so it's just so awesome. I hope you guys enjoy this video. If you want to watch the entire thing, it is posted in Patreon. You'll have to become a supporter of Weight Loss Apocalypse. Through Patreon, the link is below. It's um, at minimum a $5 a month donation. It supports me in my writing. If you would like to work with me personally, the link to my website is below. Fill in the consult request form. We'll get you scheduled probably um, within a day or two. So, all right. Enjoy. Oh, my God. <laughs> So how we work as humans, how our brains function, how our personalities are, changes dramatically when you come out of survival mode, right? And so he talks about um, Maslow, you know, so it was food, show, food, water, air, excretion, environmental safety, you know, fire, um, shelter, blankets, clothing, healthcare. The third was pack animal needs, love, bonding. Um, belonging. So those are those are the primary three. And then it goes into self-esteem and self-actualization. So it's very yeah. much more around like feeling secure with who you are and developing your own curiosity as a human being and exploration. Oh, that's so beautiful. I'm looking at it right now too. <laughs> yeah. So I, in my mind, I really, I see it differently because I see I've, I've really added to it in my own way of teaching myself, Dr. David R. Hawkins' scale of consciousness. So if you Google Dr. David R. Hawkins' scale of consciousness, he has really a dividing line between what he calls the negative levels of consciousness versus the positive levels of consciousness. And he's graded them from zero to a thousand. So anything below 200 is, is really a negative. It's the victim positionality and it goes from like, so he, he really describes, you know, survival or ego, um, narcissism is below that 200 level. It's, it's survival mode. Okay. Once someone hits 200 on a scale of consciousness, their brain changes and their level of awareness changes into these upper, level, upper levels of enlightenment. 
so he actually brought in Buddhism. He's, he was super Christian, um, you know, and so his studies of, of this, where you're at right now, we could say you're way up in probably the 500s. Oh my God. Who knows? I'm throwing it out there, but I think at some point I hit 600. I don't, I don't think I'm always there. I mean, having kids is hard to be up in that yeah. place of like Zen because you have to, you know, you're, I don't, I don't know really, but that's my assumption. Once I had kids, that was when I stopped levitating. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because then I'm like, well, that would make sense in terms of survival mode. Once a mother has children, all of a sudden you become, you're, it changes how you perceive your safety. And now you're with someone else, and now you're concerned about them. And so I, my yeah. safety is relative to their development. So it changes how I'm responding as an individual human in, in my own levels of. If I were isolated, I could, I, I will never, if by choice, go down there again. Some of it is not choice because we're animals. I can't yeah. get rid of the animal brain at this point other than to be very aware of my sense of ability. You know, we could say as animals, what throws people down into survival mode is when you do not feel that you're capable. So there's a personal sense of I'm not capable of this. So if you're in front of a bear and in, they're running after you and you're like, holy shit, I'm not capable, you're probably going to get eaten. You know, wow, yeah. <laughs> you'll be paralyzed. Ah, I can't. You know, you go into those animal reactions, which is to either fight or to flee and hide. Yeah. So if you look at Dr. Dr. Hawkins scale of consciousness, the lower levels of there's fear. So we can break down the lower scales of consciousness from fear down where it's fear. I think guilt. I don't have it in front of me. Um, I'm trying to bring it up. Right basically, now. below fear is hiding. It's when you have apathy, shame, apathy, you know, guilt. Um, and oh, I know which one. Um, your grief, grief, guilt. I think I I can't remember, but grief is in there. Where, where people feel they have lost, they are not capable. It's hopeless, right? In that case, yeah. when, when life is occurring around you, you go into hiding, you go into um, shame. Life, life is, it's always bad. Life is bad, you know what I mean? Um, you don't really have the energy either to do something about it because it just yeah. feels hopeless. Um, I do believe on the binge eating side of things, you're living kind of on that lower end of the scale because it yeah. feels hopeless, especially when you get into an area where it's like you have over 150 pounds to lose or a hundred pounds to lose where it can feel when you take, when you take dieting into account, right. And the, the radical amount of survival impulsivity it causes, right. Again, you're, threatening the first hierarchy of need, the most fundamental psychological prior priority is being threatened. And imagine you have to do that as for as long as it's going to take to lose a hundred pounds. Can you see why people go into apathy? Yeah. Hopelessness, absolutely. total hopelessness, because that is inhumane. It's wrong. Like why? And not only that, but you're supposed to do it when food is everywhere and all around you. Yeah. See that? See how that even makes it worse. And yeah. so it becomes like hopeless. And then you turn it in onto yourself as if you are a piece of shit because I should be able to handle this because the diet industry, they just think it seemed like this is the next best thing. It's going to save your life. It's going to, you know, we could look at the protocol and we can look at all sorts of different things that are going to just make it so great and easy. And it's going to be like, yeah. And it's not. Yeah. No. <laughs> So it just reinforces when it's not that you, the idea that I am not capable of this again. So you're, you're going into a state of survival that is more in hiding, trying to hide and run away. 
So as you move up the scale of consciousness, if you look at Dr. Hawkins' scale of consciousness, it goes up into fear. When you face your fear, and this is what he says, you lose your depression because below fear is not facing it. You don't think you can handle it. And so you live in depression. Yeah, that's where I've come from. Now, this is not me talking. I am referencing Dr. David Herr Hawkins' work. He, is a, he was a world-renowned psychologist who had the most successful practice in the world for decades. And yeah. he studied consciousness and all sorts of stuff. So anyway, so when you don't face your fear, you go into depression and apathy because you can't handle it. I can't handle it. Right? So what we did the other day probably pushed you out of that. You faced fear and you handled it. Just by facing it, it's like it pulls, what he would say is it pulls to you what it takes to face it by facing it. By just yeah. the willingness to do it, you pull from consciousness what it takes to do it. So you don't go into it thinking, I can handle this. Clearly, if you felt that way, you'd be above fear. You're not, right? Above right. fear is more of the arrogance and the pride and the energy of, you know, fixing things, which is good to on one hand. So you go up into those upper levels of survival mode, just still lower levels of consciousness, but you're getting into where you feel I'm capable. So you become a slave to all the work it's going to take for you to survive. So you live oh, wow. as a slave when you're in those the lower levels, but the upper end of it. You're not in apathy anymore, but you're fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting, right? Yeah. And so when you got thinner, you could go, oh, I could see I had more energy. I did feel capable, but it was, and it was very much pride oriented. So the top of the lower levels of survival mode relative to Dr. Simeon's scale is pride, which is inflated. It's like taking your survival and saying, I survive. It's like the animals that get bigger. They are, you know, like dogs that have their hair that stripe up and they're, you know, they billow up. It's like they're trying to just promote their and threaten others. So it's like the human, human inflated um, self is a survival mode. And that would be your typical narcissist that we, wow. yeah. right? <sighs> yeah. And so that's the inflate, like inflating yourself and fighting, which is war, like war, domination. That's what that is. It's a human brain in pretty extreme inflammation, but having just enough confidence to want to hurt others. Yeah. Right. Yeah. On the other side of that is a very, very steep slope down into shame. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember feeling like, you know, if I lost a couple pounds and somebody would be, oh, you look so great, and just feeling so puffed up and prideful mm -hmm. about it. And then as soon as I look at the scale and I've gone up, then there I am. Down at the bottom. You know, at and the bottom of the pit. It's hopeless. Wow. And that's where yeah. binging occurs. I remember yeah. I've ruined it. I suck. I failed. And you can go all the way up and down in that. And it's so hard because you become, you become trapped by being a slave to your pride. You have the energy to do all this work, trying to run away from what is really full of shame. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a tortured place to exist. So when you surrender your pride, right? When you surrender and you have this humility you go into grace, it kind of removes all of that. Yeah. And yeah. so in your case, we, we really surrendered to the body image, which I think was the gatekeeper for you to get out of this insanity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's opened up so many different things already and just even just over this weekend since our last session I mean I, I uh, before I felt like I couldn't really have like a connection with God and now I, I just feel open like it's free flowing between us now yeah well and you should feel that with everything yeah like yeah. oh 
everything here is an expression of that. Yeah. Everything. Yeah, I can see everything clearly and, and absorb the beauty around me. And, mm -hmm. and it's always been there. Yeah. It's not like all of a sudden you earned it and it's coming to you. No, it's always been there. You just yeah. didn't, you just were super distracted. Yep. Looking yep. through a ton, looking through tunnel vision, thinking that's all that's existed was tunnel vision. Yeah. Not realizing that no tunnel vision is not supposed to be there. You have the ability to see huge range, not visually. I'm talking like spiritually, emotionally. Right. It's massive. Like you said, it's like, it's like it's opening up and like, yep. And it doesn't stop. It's infinity. <sighs> Awesome. It just makes you aware too of rel relativity. It's like, oh, well, relative to each position or each tunnel vision someone's looking at, what they're seeing is true relative to that position and that tunnel vision. Yes. yes. They have no idea that they have tunnel vision though. So why I'm saying, well, all this exists and they're like, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You know. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, you just have to go, okay. They'll figure it out. You know, it's yeah. kind of like body image. So we're talking, let's talk about that. In order for you to be happy and to be, feel good about yourself, you need to be thinner. Yeah, that's how I felt. Tunnel vision. Yeah. Do you see how that basically you become trapped and enslaved? Yeah. That's all you see. That's all your, cause your entire survival is depending on it. Yeah. Then you are now going into threatening your food because to, the food becomes the threat, right? Food becomes the block to that happiness. Right? So you right. go into dieting, restricting. I need to control it. We need to organize it. I have to make plans and I have to, you know, you start to put all of that energy into dieting, but in the end, what that really does is it just makes your brain think about food all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so for me, and that's why I think they, they call it an eating disorder because that's the obvious side effect that you see with food. Yeah. Yep. But it's not really an eating disorder. No. Do you see that clearly now? Yes, absolutely. That is just your human nature working. Because you're you're kind of extreme in your desire to be thinner. Yeah. Which is the only reason why you'd threaten your food. So food is obviously threatened. You know, when I see someone... It's like, yes, I'm a binge eater or I'm addicted to food. The first thing I think of is, oh, well, they are, in their minds, they believe they should be dieting or depriving in a radical way. Yeah. It's a radical sense of I should deprive. I should deprive. Deprivation is coming. I shouldn't be eating, you know, so they feel constant danger with food, which is why they are over consuming. It's, it's very animalistic. Yeah. And they don't see that. They see it as I must be, there's something wrong with me because why can't I stop eating even though I'm physically getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's affecting my life? Why can't yeah. I stop eating? Well, it's because you can't stop feeling ashamed about your weight, which puts a posi you in a position to have to chronically deprive. And the more you're overeating and the bigger you get, the bigger the deprivation is. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. I, I describe it. I'm trying to write it and I'm using the example of a sinking ship that you're on a sinking ship. And in order for you to just stay buoyant, you have to get pails of water and get rid of the water. Right. Yeah. But that's all you do all day long. The idea yeah. that you've been no, sold. Really right. But the idea you were told is that, well, once you're buoyant, once you're balanced, once you're, you know, on water and you're not sinking anymore is it'll move forward and then you can explore the world. Right. Yeah. But you don't, 
you, every day you fill up basket, pour it out. And that's all you do every day. And then you wake up and it's sinking and you just do it again the next day. And you never really get to that point where it's not sinking anymore. Wow. To where yep. the so so in terms of a binge eater, they get to a place where they just need a break. They're like, I'm gonna let it sink for a little, because I know right before it sinks, I'm gonna work it all out. I'm gonna get it out as fast as I can because I can handle <laughs> it. So I'm not gonna worry about it. And the water starts flooding in, and you're just like, I just need a break. And the boat gets bigger, right? So this is an expandable boat, which means wow. it's holding more water. And can you imagine what it would feel like to know you, every time you just take a break that it gets worse? The amount of work to get all that water out of the ship gets to such a degree that you know you are an indentured servant to it. Yeah. And uh, oh my gosh, that's such a good illustration. Isn't it? So the wow. anorexic is doing the same thing. But they take pride in not having any water in their boat. So they become obsessed about cleaning the boat. So they're, they're not going anywhere either. And they're also moving pails of water out of the boat, but they're doing it to an extreme.